Welcome to Enhancing Recognition and Treatment of Seizure Clusters and Emergencies. My name is Patty Osborne Schaefer, uh, Senior Director for Health Information and Resources of the Epilepsy Foundation and a member of the American Association of Neuroscience Nurses. I want to welcome all of you to our webinar today. This is um, being sponsored actually by a grant uh, from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention to the Epilepsy Foundation, of which the American Academy of Neuroscience Nurses is a partner. We call this grant the, Na the National Epilepsy Education and Awareness Collaborative. AANN has been a very active partner. And uh, for this year, their, uh, their part of this is to really sponsor and bring these webinars on epilepsy to you. So I first wanna really thank AANN uh, for doing this with us. So today's session, as, as I mentioned in the title, is Enhancing Recognition and Treatment of Seizure Emergencies. The objectives will be to recognize status epilepticus, cluster seizures, and other potential seizure emergencies, to recall seizure medications that are recommended for treating convulsive status epilepticus, as well as emerging therapies for cluster seizures, and then identify ways to implement seizure response plans in the care of persons with epilepsy. Also to draw your attention to uh, the content that we're using to talk about convulsive status epilepticus um, is derived from the uh, guidelines for convulsive status epilepticus developed by the American uh, Epilepsy Society. And you can find these um, on the AES website and we'll share that with you at the end. And also the algorithm that's available, we'll make that available to you as well. AES has also been a, a partner in the NEEAC and has been very helpful uh, to all of us. I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Stephanie Chen is an epilepsy nurse practitioner at Barrow Neurological Institute at St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center. Madonna Pluger is a neuroscience clinical nurse specialist at Dignity Health St. Joseph's Hospital and Medical Center and also Barrow Neurological Institute. She is also a member of AANN's board of directors. We'll then be joined by Erin Feske, uh, who's an epilepsy nurse practitioner at Children's Mercy Hospital and Clinics. Uh, all speakers have no conflict of interest to report. Uh, the slide tells you the program's made possible with funding for the Centers for Disease Control. And to keep in mind, the contents, though, are solely the responsibility of the authors and do not necessarily represent the views of the CDC. Now, a few disclosures to make. Uh, during this program, we will discuss the medications that are not approved for out-of-hospital treatment of seizures. Some are being evaluated for use in acute seizures or cluster seizures in different formulations. This presentation was previously presented at the 2018 AAN annual meeting, or at least most of it was, has been adapted. Parts of this presentation are also from Epilepsy Foundation uh, presentations used with other audiences. And as I previously mentioned, the AES status guidelines can be obtained through www.aesnet.org. To receive continuing education credits for this program, please complete the entire evaluation form and AAN will contact you with instructions on how to obtain the CEUs within three to four uh, weeks after completion of the webinar. And this webinar will be put up um, on the ANN Learning Management System so that you can listen to it in its entirety and complete your CEUs through there. So now I'd like to invite uh, Stephanie to take over. Thank you, Patty. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on our webinar. Um, I'm going to start with this slide. So when is a seizure, uh, when is a seizure not just a seizure? So one thing is when uh, seizures start changing in frequency or pattern, and these are called cluster seizures. And they're not really well defined among the professional and community groups, but they are common adverse events in epilepsy monitoring units and acute, acute care settings. And I'll even venture to say even in the primary care office, a lot of patients will present like this. Um, they can occur in people with new onset epilepsy or patients uh, who've uh, are refractory to several epilepsy medications. And they may be a precursor to status epilepticus, which is a neurological emergency. Next slide, please. So what is status epilepticus? It's one of the most common causes of mortality in people with epilepsy. And you know, one of the reasons for this webinar is 
uh, accurate information about the treatment of cluster seizures in status epilepticus is not widely disseminated among nurses uh, and other professionals taking care of people with epilepsy and not really disseminated to people with epilepsy themselves. And today we wanted to review uh, the new guidelines that define convulsive status epilepticus and present an evidence-based treatment algorithm for children and adults. Next slide, please. All right, so when do we need to start worrying about someone who's having more and more seizures? Next slide. So we're gonna start with a case scenario. This is about Bob. He's a 30-year-old male with medically refractory epilepsy. His first seizure was at age 12. It was a convulsive seizure, and he was started on anti-seizure medications at that time. His seizures are described as recurrent tingling of his right arm with no changes in awareness, and they last about 10 to 15 seconds, and they oftentimes occur alone, but sometimes, um, which is rare, they can occur in clusters. His triggers are sleep deprivation, and oftentimes his seizures occur upon awakening or early in the morning hours. So now he has clusters of several seizures a day, um, up to three to four times a month, and this is definitely different from his baseline. Uh, this morning, he woke up with mild tremors of his right side, and he also mentions that he's, had, he's woken up with recent urinary incontinence, which is not very common, and to him, this is a sign that he's having convulsions at night, um, or the other word for that is bilateral tonic-clonic seizures. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about Bob and where he is in terms of his care of his epilepsy. Uh, he was originally seen by his primary care, but was referred to epilepsy clinic, and medication changes were begun to uh, treat these increased seizures, but no rescue therapy was given. So last night, he had a cluster of his seizures, followed by a generalized tonic-clonic seizure at 6 a.m. His family became really worried uh, after his second generalized tonic-clonic seizure at 7 a.m., so about an hour after his first one, and they called 911. And the paramedics gave him lorazepam on the way to the emergency room. In the emergency room, he was non-responsive. He had mild tremors on his right side, and then he had a third generalized tonic-clonic seizure an hour after arriving. Next slide. So what are some things that uh, the emergency room should think about when they get a case like Bob in their care. So first question is, is he still having seizures? Um, when someone goes uh, into a seizure emergency, sometimes it may be hard to see the original symptoms that they, they developed or that their seizures typically, typically present at, as. And so he's, since he's unresponsive, we have to think about, um, is he still having seizures that we can't see? Um, and another question to ask is, does he have known epilepsy and what medicines are they taking? Uh, in terms of if a patient has epilepsy, uh, it's important to know, um, are they compliant with their meds? Um, and it may be good to check a drug level, a serum drug level in the emergency room to see if they are compliant. Next question is, you know, what is the best approach to stop the seizures? Uh, if the patient is unresponsive, the best approach probably is to put an IV in and get some benzodiazepine in them. What is the cause of the seizure and how to treat? Um, if there is a uh, cause for the seizure, such as uh, metabolic electrolyte imbalance, it may be good to treat that uh, as you're treating them with seizure medications. Does the patient need to be hospitalized? And if so, where? Uh, is the emergency room in the hospital that Bob's at the best place to monitor him? Do they have the resources, the ability to do continuous EEG monitoring if we need to know if he's having ongoing seizures? So that goes along with the question, does he need continuous EEG monitoring to see if his seizure activity is continuing uh, because he has altered mental status and has this continuing right tremor? Next slide, please. So when to worry? These are red flags that um, that indicate that a patient may be uh, in a seizure emergency. So if someone has a uh, provoked versus an unprovoked seizure, that is an emergency. 
uh, a first time seizure, seizures lasting more than five minutes, or repeated seizures without regaining consciousness. Definitely, you should be worried if there's a change in type or frequency of seizures or if after a seizure that the patient has injured themselves, they, they fell and hit their head or they have laceration or they dislocated their shoulder. Um, if a patient is pregnant, that's definitely something to go to the uh, emergency room for, or if they have a known associated medical condition. So if maybe they have uh, COPD, that could be exacerbated by a seizure. Uh, if a seizure occurs in water, that's definitely an indication to go to the uh, emergency room. And then if the patient has difficulty breathing after a seizure or just doesn't breathe at all, that is a red flag. Next slide. So this is just a reminder of all the different settings uh, that could be in involved in Bob's care. So no matter where you work as a nurse, whether you're in the pre-hospital setting at a clinic, emergency department, ICU, EMU, um, a transition to epilepsy or a neurology clinic, or even if you're a home health nurse, uh, seizure emergencies can, can uh, appear at any time. So it's good no matter in what setting you are to be uh, ready to treat these. Next slide. Um, this, this slide is a little bit busy, um, but I'll try to guide you through it. Uh, this just shows uh, where a patient is evaluated after, uh, for example, they have a suspect, suspected seizure starting at the top. And oftentimes they are evaluated in the emergency room or by a primary care provider, sometime a neurologist, but usually it's a neurologist who's been consulted by the ED. Um, the seizure is either confirmed or uh, not confirmed. Um, if a person with a first time seizure has a second seizure, then by definition of epilepsy, that is a, they do have epilepsy. Uh, epilepsy is where you have two or more unprovoked seizures greater than 24 hours apart. And so at this point, the patient can be referred to the neurologist and patients oftentimes have seizures that are well controlled once they're put on medications or occasional seizures or persistent seizures. If their seizures are well controlled, they can be followed up by neurology or even primary care. Uh, but if they have occasional seizures or persistent seizures, this is a good indication to refer to an epilepsy health uh, epilepsy center. Um, oftentimes patients are not well controlled and they just sort of go in and out of care with their primary care for many years and not really getting the treatment they need or they may be a good candidate for surgery and they don't get it. Um, and so I think the statistic is that uh, patients with refractory epilepsy, it often takes them 20 years to get to an epilepsy center uh, to get the treatment they need. And I wanted to point out that a seizure emergency can happen at any level of care. So it's, it's good to know uh, whether you're in the primary care setting, general neurology setting, or epilepsy specialty, how to treat seizure emergencies. Next slide. So going back to the basics, uh, what is a seizure? Uh, a seizure is a symptom of disturbance in the brain. It's a sudden surge of abnormal electrical discharges from complex chemical changes in the brain and can be a manifestation or symptom of many medical problems. So it could be a provoked seizure, meaning that the seizure was triggered by, uh, for example, drug use or um, hypoglycemia, perhaps they're a diabetic and they took too much insulin and now they're hypoglycemic and are um, having a seizure. Uh, unprovoked seizures are seizures with no known cause. Next slide. So epilepsy is two or more unprovoked seizures greater than 24 hours apart or one seizure with risk of recurrent seizures and when I say risk of recurrent seizures, I mean uh, they, they did an MRI in the emergency room and this patient has a structural abnormality. Uh, for example, they found an old stroke or uh, they have a tumor or something like that, then um, they're at risk for recurrent seizures. Um, you can also have epilepsy if you're diagnosed with an epilepsy syndrome, uh, which is like Lennox-Gastaut or Dravet's syndrome. Uh, uh, Dravet's. Um, and basically an epilepsy syndrome is a, def is a defined group of features usually occurring together. So these features can include types of seizures commonly seen, age of when the seizures 
began, part of the brain involved, um, genetic information. So the term epilepsy equals seizure disorder, but seizures are not always due to epilepsy. Next slide. And I just wanted to review, this is the new classification of seizure types uh, from the International League Against Epilepsy, and this came out in 2017. And so basically, we have uh, two to three categories for how we characterize seizures. So there's focal onset uh, with uh, impaired awareness or without impaired awareness, which is aware. Um, and focal onset seizures used to be called partial seizures or complex partial seizures, but this is a new way to describe them. Um, and we also have generalized onset seizures. And then there's also unknown onset, and unknown onset is just we're not really sure what kind of seizures they have. But it's important to characterize a patient's seizures because there's certain medications that work better for focal onset or better for generalized onset. And another point about this slide is it's good to all be on the same page about how we define seizures. Um, so I know a lot of times um, uh, providers are still using more outdated terms like partial seizures, complex partial seizures, but this is the updated classification of seizures. Next slide. Um, so that's the end of my section. I'm gonna hand the microphone over to Madonna Pluger. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That was a great introduction and overview. This morning, I'm going to talk about, um, really spend some time on the guidelines and really focus that on the foundation of care and reference. We are so um, fortunate to actually have guidelines in place. So first, as we go to the next slide, we're gonna talk about seizure clusters. And so cluster seizures or seizure clusters are really a part of how epilepsy can be expressed. They're an example of that. Um, as in so many things in the neurosciences, there's no clear consensus on terminology. Although on your screen, you'll see very um, skilled authors and researchers that have attempted to uh, find a consensus on seizure clusters, one of them being Jan Bulow and her colleagues um, that wrote an article in Epilepsy Behavior in 2016. Um, in that article, there's reference to the cluster seizures having a change in frequency, pattern or type of seizures, and the impact and when to treat, which is different from the typical seizures. So even though we do not have a clear consensus, we are starting to shape the definition of cluster seizures. Cluster seizures can be a precursor to status epilepticus. Next slide, please. So frequency and impact. Self-reported clusters, so that is three or greater seizures in a 24-hour period, have occurred, and this is a reference in the article that's cited on the bottom of the page here on the webinar, 20, in 29% of people uh, via a seizure diary study. So they were doing uh, referencing to uh, interpretation by patients and families. Clustering associated with a history of convulsive status other seizure-related hospitalization, and worse seizure control. Cluster seizures have a greater risk for injury and SUDEP, and cluster seizures, the frequency and the impact actually results in lost time from work, school, engaging in activities of daily living. Next slide. Let's discuss some facts about status epilepticus. 50,000 to 150,000 Americans will have an event of status epilepticus each year. 15% of people with epilepsy will experience an episode of status epilepticus in their lifetime. This is a serious condition. Mortality is 3% in children and can be up to 30% in adults. The prognosis can be related, of course, to the cause and the length of the status epilepticus and the age of the person. The goal of treatment is to stop clinical and electrical seizure activity as fast as possible, and of course, to reduce mortality and morbidity. Next slide, please. It's important to look at the definitions that have been put in place from the AES status guidelines for convulsive status epilepticus. 
The definition of a brief or typical seizure is less than five minutes. Prolonged seizures are events that occur between five and 30 minutes. For status epilepticus, the textbook definition is more than 30 minutes of either continuous seizure activity or two or more seizures without full recovery of consciousness between events. Next slide, please. So this slide talks about the treatment definitions for convulsive status epilepticus. Again, thinking about treating promptly and as soon as possible, Treatment protocols for status use, five minutes to define convulsive status epilepticus. The goal is to minimize the risk of seizures to reach 30 minutes and to minimize risk of intervening on brief typical seizures that will stop on their own. These guidelines have been put in place and they use studies of prolonged seizures and status epilepticus to define what the treatment protocols look like. Next slide. There are other types of status epilepticus. Non-convulsive status, epi excuse me, status epilepticus um, is often seen in our intensive care units. It's seen throughout acute care, um, a lot of times without the clinician being aware of this. But the definition is long or repeated absence or focal impaired awareness, complex partial seizures. Patients may present confused and not be fully aware of what is going on. They have a change in their baseline mental status or behavior, but there's really no consistent duration. And the continuous EEG is needed to help define the diagnosis of it being non-convulsive status epilepticus. And then there is epilepsia partialis continua, which is repeated focal seizures without the change in awareness. This is when our epilepsy monitoring unit comes into play for accurate definition and diagnosis the video EEG is needed to define EPC. Next slide, please. So we're going to just briefly go back to Bob because we don't ever want to leave our patient and we all hear every day about how we need to be patient-centered care and we do um, in epilepsy and everything else in the neurosciences, we need to go back to what our individual patient needs. And as you listen to this webinar, you also need to go back to what you heard Stephanie say, that a patient can present with status in any care. So it can be home care all the way to the ICU and throughout the continuum. So Bob's progress. So Bob was actually diagnosed with having status epilepticus. He um, had tonic-clonic seizures and they were stopped after he was given lorazepam IV but he never woke up. He was really non-responsive and it persisted. The tremors in the right arms were continued intermittently. So sometimes an assessment they'd be there and sometimes an assessment they wouldn't be there. The workup began for the cause of um, status. And so far it's non-revealing. His family's really high stressed and um, haven't gotten sleep because of course they're worried about Bob. And they can't really know what the future holds at the moment, like so many of our patients that we care for, because he's had problems before and his work hasn't been a steady work. He's had problems. So they, they're worrying about Bob, but they're also worrying about what the future for Bob's going to be and economically what is going to happen and all the other stressors that come with a chronic situation. Bob sent to the ICU for continuous EEG monitoring and stabilization. So a question for us to ponder is, is Bob having persistent focal seizures? Maybe EPC? Something to think about as we move forward. Next slide, please. So we're gonna just let Bob be under the care of those great nurses in the ICU for a while and revisit how he's doing a little bit later on in this webinar. But now we're gonna spend some time on the treatment of status epilepticus and really looking at the guidelines. Next slide, please. Before we dig into the guidelines, we need to pause and think about the dilemmas that exist. We know that there's a general agreement in basic principles of therapy for emergency care of seizure emergencies. We feel pretty good that there's standard protocols in place and the goal of therapy and medication management varies 
a little bit in emergency care, but it really varies dramatically as a person moves to the continuum. In past, therapy has been aimed at reducing and not stopping seizures. And we've had ineffective therapies uh, ranging from sedatives, paralytics, or wrong doses of anti-seizure drugs being used. We've also had delay in treatment and we've had delay in moving our patients from one level of care to a higher level of, cur of care. And unfortunately, that still occurs way too often. Next slide, please. This slide shows what we're really um, spending a lot of our time today talking about is our evidence-based guidelines. Um, that does come, as Patty said in our introduction, from the American Epilepsy Society. And it's a very strong guideline and it has taken quite a bit of time to come to fruition. The treatment of convulsive status epilepticus in children and adults is really a good baseline and foundation for anyone out there that's listening and thinking about doing a status epilepticus protocol in your EMR or talking about what that looks like. You really need this as a foundation to build from and it will help guide your care and build your protocols. Next slide, please. So this proposed algorithm, which actually is in effect and in use, and we will get this in your hands if you don't have it, we'll get you access of how to get it. Um, it's intervention for pre-hospital settings with trained paramedics. It's uh, there for emergency room personnel to use, and it's there throughout the continuum of care for inpatient settings. Next slide, please. This is an example, and it really is a tiered approach. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's, it's better to like look at it in an eight by 11 um, view, but it really does walk you through what the patient needs in that moment. Um, and it's on the side, it, it shows the time frame, and then it really talks about whether seizures stop or whether they continue. And if they continue, it really causes you to pause and really go to the next intervention. I mentioned briefly about um, you know, developing your own status protocol in your different facilities. And I would say again that if you use this as a foundation, you can really build on the tiers of it and make a very strong protocol. But this really needs to be your foundation of care. Next slide, please. This slide, just to pause again, is just to really focus that as we have a person that's in status, we need to go back to the basics of seizure first aid. And this is the same approach among all age groups, pediatrics to adult. And in the first five to 10 minutes, or excuse me, zero to five minutes, it really is back to the basics of what you do in the event of a seizure happening, how you keep the patient safe, how you protect the environment, how you do not restrain them, how you really look at the presentation and really spend some time figuring out how to care best for that patient and how to keep them safe. Next slide. This um, then talks about what happens after five minutes. So you are keeping them safe, you have the environment safe, you're watching what they do, but the seizure continues. And if this slide really, you know, it shows the ambulance and it's not acute care and it's not, you know, in the ICU or the EMU or um, in a clinic, although at the clinic you probably would take the ambulance going to the hospital. But if it's been greater than five minutes, you need to get that patient to the hospital and you need to do it as quickly as possible. Next slide. The basic principles are always good to go back to. And as we look at the algorithm and we talk about how the quicker we do things, the better the patient's gonna be, we can't forget that there's an entire body system that needs to be supported as well. And this slide does a really nice job of supporting the basic principles and care of a person in status. It all goes back all the time, every time to ABCs and really caring for your patient to make sure that you're supporting their respiration, you're checking their airway, breathing, circulation, doing a quick neuro exam, checking for trauma, and especially important if the, um, the seizure presentation is not a witness one or something that you come on. You give oxygen if needed. You, of course, consider intubation if in respiratory distress. 
Make sure you're looking at the blood pressure, monitoring the vital signs, checking out the heart. Make sure, of course, that you have a really good IV access, and sometimes that's easier said than done, but the clearer IV access you have from the very beginning, the better you're going to be. And all the time, every time, really get into the detective mode of identifying and treating the cause and the consequence. Uh, finger sick for blood glucose, giving examples here of giving glucose for less than 60, giving thiamine to adults, uh, and then drawing lab work for the different um, battery of labs that are listed there, electrolytes, hematology, toxic screen. And then, of course, if you know the patient is on anti-seizure drugs, to do some levels if it's pertinent. Next slide. This slide looks at the effectiveness of the anti-seizure drugs that we give to our patients that are in status epilepticus. According to the status guidelines, the first drug that is given has a positive result of over 50%, in fact, 55.5%. As you can see on this slide, as you get to the second, third, fourth, or more, or at the bottom when there's really no effectiveness, things decrease. Next slide, please. So now we're on our way to the hospital. We've gotten to the hospital and we're into the initial therapy phase. And this phase, according to the guidelines, is five to 20 minutes. We, of course, begin the medications. When the seizures reach the five minutes, we give the first anti-seizure drug as a single dose. And benzos are the first choice. So that's your uh, intermuscular Versed or midazolam, your IV lorazepam or Ativan, or your IV diazepam or Valium. Doses listed in the algorithm, excuse me, algorithm as initial therapy was used in class one trials. And consensus trials and other published literature may use different doses. But it's a guideline that we um, from the American Epilepsy Society and the folks that wrote the guidelines feel um, is pretty pertinent and important to always remember to go to the benzos as a first choice. Pre-hospital use, of course, if you're on your way, um, there are rectal forms of the benzos, intranasal or buccal therapy, and we'll talk a little bit later about the different um, formats of drug therapy and the duration of response. Um, and if IV or IM are not available, it's important to know what other treatment options are there. Next slide, please. So unfortunately, um, status sometimes is very, very hard to treat and the phases keep going and now you're into the 20 to 40 minute phase. And the drugs, according to the guidelines there, begin when the seizure reaches 20 minutes. So it really is a tiered approach. It ends at 40 minutes from time of seizure onset. And here is when drugs such as phosphenatoin, valproic acid, or levotriacetam, Dilantin, Depakote, and Keppra are options. IV phenobarbital is out there as an option if the above are not available. Next slide. The third therapy phase, or the time when the duration reaches 40 minutes and longer, is then, of course, when the 40 minutes from seizure onset occurs. This is when your patient should be on EEG monitoring and inpatient care. Um, it would be a disservice to our patient if we didn't have our patients in the intensive care unit um, long before this time getting the acute uh, interventions that are needed. There's really no clear evidence to guide therapy according to AES guidelines, but the importance is to consider repeating the second line therapy. And at this point, this is, you just go through the tier and if one thing doesn't work, you keep moving according to the guidelines. And this is when in the ICU discussions about pentobarbital, um, versed drips, profofol, et cetera, um, is occurring. And uh, again, when I talked earlier about building on the guidelines and the status protocol, I know at our facility, it is something that we're using to actually have as a tiered approach as far as when to go next to Profofol and Penobarbital and build it upon after the guidelines that we've went through the 40 minutes or longer. Next slide. I would like to invite Erin Feske to talk about Bob's progress. Thank you, Madonna. Um, so we're going to circle back to Bob. And at this point, Bob was transferred to the epilepsy monitoring unit once his status epilepticus um, had stopped. He's now awake and alert. 
Um, as Madonna mentioned, he's still having these episodic right arm tremors, but they're less often. We have him on video EEG, we're continuing his anti-seizure medications, we're making adjustments to those, and they're using IV lorazepam for clusters um, or after a single tonic-clonic seizure. So we're using our IV medications, we're making adjustments to his daily medications, and in preparation for getting him home, the nurse is assessing his need for rescue therapy at home and discussing what his options are and what those guidelines need to be for Bob. And so this is where it's really important that um, as Stephanie started talking about and as Madonna spoke about, nurses in every setting really being involved in making sure that we're getting the appropriate therapies to patients. Next slide. And so now we're going to start talking about rescue therapies and seizure response plans. Next slide. So what are rescue therapies? Our rescue therapies are, are emergency medications or as-needed medications. Um, so these are treatments that we prescribe to stop clusters of seizures, to stop prolonged seizures, um, to stop seizures when they're occurring at predictable times, things that we can kind of predict or have advanced knowledge that we may have an increase during a certain time. Um, but they are not daily medications and they're not to be used instead of a daily medication. Um, to me, if I have a patient who's using rescue treatments, uh, that's an indication to me that I actually need to adjust their daily medications. So I, do, I don't wanna use those as a crutch. Um, the intent of them is to stop seizures quickly, to lessen the severity and to prevent seizure emergencies. We want to stop seizures before they get to that past five minute mark or even to that 30 minute mark. We wanna be addressing them quickly. Next slide. So rescue medications start working on the brain quickly when they're given immediately. So unlike our anti-seizure medications where you're going to need several doses to get a therapeutic level, the ideal rescue medication is going to be therapeutic at that single dose. So you're going to be able to give it and have a response. Um, we want to use these medications outside of the hospital. Um, so we, we want to reduce the need of our patients needing to go to the hospital and improve access to emergency care when needed. Um, but they don't take place of emergency medical treatment. And so it's, it's that in-home response, but that doesn't mean that patients will never need to go to the ER, and it doesn't mean that we don't need to educate our patients about um, indications to go to the emergency department or when they need to seek additional support. Next slide. So rescue therapies are very individualized. It's important to know what the individual's typical seizure type and pattern looks like, so that way we can help recognize when something's not typical and when we need to be addressing that. Um, so as we've talked about, clusters are not a well-defined entity, and so often we define them based on the patient. Um, and so it's important to teach the patient and family how to recognize a cluster for them. Um, if you have home videos in the day and age of cell phones, we have lots of videos of seizures, which can be very helpful. If you have those or if you have EMU monitoring results, it can be helpful to actually show the family what they need to be treating um, and when they need to be treating. We need to talk to our families and our patients about when to use the rescue therapies. We don't want them to use it too soon, but we also don't want them to use it too late. And so we need to be very clear about what parameters they want to be giving the rescue therapy for. Uh, we need to talk about how to give it. Um, how are you going to get a medication into a patient who's actively seizing? Um, and how to monitor after you give it if you need to do any monitoring. What kind of concerns do we need to watch out for? When are those red flags that we need to go to the next level? Um, and when to call for emergency help? We also need to make sure that we're developing a seizure response plan. And all of that education with the family goes into that response plan. Um, and response plans are not just for our pediatric patients who are going to school. They are for our adult patients, they're for our pediatric patients, they're for everyone to really make sure that we have a standardized way that we're approaching seizure emergencies for this patient. Next slide. So this is an example of a seizure response plan from the Epilepsy Foundation. Um, and, and these are easily accessible, um, they're easy to fill out, and they're very easy to read. 
um, the important po components is that we've got the patient's information on there. We have their name, we have their date of birth, we have emergency contact information in the event that they are not at home, and we have information about their seizures. What are their seizure types or what do they call their seizures? You can put seizure nicknames for um, some of that information. What happens? What does their body do during that seizure? How long does it typically last and how often does it typically happen? And then there's a spot for those as needed treatments, um, which could be a VNS magnet swipe or it could be a benzodiazepine like Madonna was speaking about. Next slide. Those seizure response plans also have that standard seizure first aid. Um, and so we really want to make sure that everyone is responding to seizures the same way and providing people with written seizure first aid repeatedly and in a multiple different fashions is going to help with that. And then it has the section for call 911 if. Um, and there's a lot of options that you guys can check for your individual patients, but Generally, those are the red flags that we worry about for patients um, for prolonged seizures. Those are times that we want to seek out additional help. Next slide. So what do we want in our rescue therapies? We want something that's going to work against all seizure types, right? Because a patient might need a rescue therapy if they have a new seizure type. And so we want to make sure that our medication works for everything. We want to use something that's safe because we're thinking about giving this to families to use at home, and so it needs to be safe for the patient to take. We want it to be potent in small volumes, um, which is important to consider that we want to be able to give someone a very small amount of medication and have it be very strong for them. We want it to be quick, easy, and safe to administer, right? There's nothing like being in an emergency and having to draw up a medication or um, having to go through an extensive process, we want it to be very easy for our families to do or for a lay person to do. We want it to work very quickly. We want to have a rapid onset, but we also want it to keep working. So we don't want it to wear off within a matter of minutes or seconds and then have to worry about having another seizure. Um, and we don't want to have a lot of extensive monitoring. Remember, these are medications that we're trying to give so that patients are not in um, the emergency department. Next slide. So we can give medications rectally, internasally, um, vocal or sublingual. Um, patients who have a vagal nerve stimulator, you can use a magnet swipe. Um, and then this is, this is an area of ongoing research, and so there are other approaches being developed. Um, but the important thing is that we have ways to access the body outside of um, invasive lines or IVs. Next slide. So how quickly do these drugs start working? And this is an important slide. I would encourage all of you guys to take a look at this um, once the webinar is posted again, because when you're educating our families about what medication has been chosen for this patient, it's important to set appropriate expectations of how long before that medication is going to work um, because seizures feel like an eternity. And once you've given, you've waited what feels like an eternity or the five minutes to give your emergency medication, and then we're saying that these rectal medications can, can take several more minutes to work, it's really important to set those expectations with our families so that they know what to expect um, for that medication and they don't feel like it didn't work because it just took longer than they thought it should. Next slide. So we have a couple FDA approved options for rescue therapies in the home setting um, to stop prolonged seizures. The one that's been around the longest is the rectal diazepam gel. Um, the, these are rectal syringe kits. They come with typically two syringes and some lubricants. So they can be given rectally. Um, they come in a certain standard set of dosings, but there you have a, um, a, a dial and so the pharmacist can adjust that dosing based on the patient age and weight. One thing is important to know with this one is that the dosing changes based on age and weight. Um, and so very young children sometimes can have higher doses than adults and it's because how, of how they metabolize the medication. And so that's just an important reference point as you're looking at these dosings. Um, but rectal diazepam is easy to give. Um, it's very accessible. It comes in those kits of two. For, so for kids that are in school or daycare, you automatically have one for home and one for school. 
Um, and then internasal midazolam was recently approved by the FDA for seizure clusters. Um, and so that's another very easy to give a nasal spray in the event of a seizure. Um, and it's FDA approved for clusters in children 12 and up. Next slide. Um, and so this goes over that new research for the midazolam nasal spray and the outpatient treatment of patients with seizure clusters. The bullet points here are that this is uh, safe in a single dosage nasal spray in the outpatient settings. Um, we had some randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials in children over the age of 12, um, and it had good success as compared to placebo, which is what we want. Um, nasal midazolam has been around and used off-label by um, emergency departments and by EMTs for some time, and so it's really nice to see that it's accessible to our families now in certain situations. Next slide. So we have some non-FDA approved medications. Um, intranasal diazepam is pending FDA approval, so we do expect to be hearing that that is an option as well soon too. Uh, benzodiazepine oral film, um, so this would be something that is dissolvable film for our families. We have our sublingual or buccal benzodiazepines, um, so you can use dissolvable clonazepam for some patients. Um, inhaled medications and subcutaneous medications are also things that um, are, are being investigated and hopefully will be more accessible to our patients in the future. And it's important when considering what option we're thinking about the patient. Um, so while rectal diazepam is FDA approved, giving a rectal medication to someone in public is not socially acceptable. And so it's an important point to consider about how likely is the family going to be to give the medication given what medication you're prescribing. Next slide. So when are we going to use rescue therapies? We're going to use them if the cluster is different than their usual type or seizure pattern. So if a patient um, typically has one seizure every six months and they have two in a day, that may be a cluster for them. And so that may be an indication for a rescue therapy. If they have more seizures than usual or they occur over a short period of time, we may consider a rescue therapy or when seizures are longer or are different than typical events. Generally, we consider, you know, continuous seizure of five minutes. This is a situation that we're going to want to give a rescue therapy, and cluster definitions are going to vary patient to patient based on their baseline. So it's important to know what is typical for this patient. Um, I also briefly mentioned earlier that we might think about using it during high-risk times. So you might use your rescue medications if you're making a medication change at home. So if you suddenly have to take a patient off a medication because they had an allergic reaction, you might use rescue therapies while you work to transition them to a different medication. You might use it in Bob's case at discharge from the hospital to home before they're fully up on their um, therapeutic levels. If you have a patient who has an increased amount of seizures when they get sick, you might use rescue therapies during illness um, or if they've missed their daily medications and are at high risk for a seizure emergency, you might use rescue medications. Next slide. So as we transition to outpatient care and home, we wanna make sure that our families know when the last seizure was, what's the plan for medication changes at discharge, and what's their plan for rescue therapies. Um, if there is an opportunity to use and trial their rescue therapy in the hospital setting, you might consider trying it to see how the patient responds. You wanna help them create that seizure response plan so that everyone has access to this is the emergency plan. And you want to educate anyone who could be giving the rescue therapy on how to give it. How are we going to give it? What's that going to look like? What do they need to do? What do they need to monitor for? Make sure that we have coverage for our emergency medication as well as our daily medications. And make sure that anyone who cares for this patient has access to that emergency medication and knows the plan. So communicating with the school about those seizure response plans and then educate, educate, educate on our first aid and general safety to make sure that we're keeping patients safe during this time. Next slide. So Bob's seizures are controlled and we've changed his medications. Um, we used our rescue medication in a taper during that medication change, and then we've adjusted so he has a rescue therapy at home use. So given his age, 
He's using sublingual or vocal um, medication for clusters of focal aware seizures. And the family knows that the plan is to bring him to the emergency room if he progresses to a tonic clonic seizure. He's gonna monitor for the effect of the medication changes and communicate with his primary epilepsy provider about that. And we're gonna consi consider change to intranasal if we don't respond to the vocal medications. And then think about next steps for Bob, about how to make sure that this, we don't get into this situation again. Next slide. So as we close, we wanted to just leave these resources. Um, these are available on the Epilepsy Foundation website. They are fantastic. Um, it's this great um, picture on our seizure first aid. And then um, we have our resources for status epilepticus. And a great video on responding to seizures. So I'd encourage you to go to the Epilepsy Foundation website to find all of those resources. And with that, I will hand it back to you, Patty. Well, I'd like to thank all of our speakers today and all of our attendees to be staying with us uh, to learn more about uh, seizure emergencies and rescue therapies. Um, we are going to be having another webinar on comorbidities and epilepsy with the focus on mood and behavior on Thursday, October 3rd. And this would also be at a, a noon time on East Coast. Um, all of these uh, webinars are going to be housed on the American Academy of Neuroscience Nursing's website. You'll all get a notice of when they're there so you can view them again, get your CEs, and we encourage them to, for you to share that with your colleagues. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time.